Okay, let me then turn to uh, taking a look at economic developments, particularly over the last month. Some of them I'll deal with at the beginning rather quickly, and then others we'll spend a bit more uh, time on. The uh, overview to start with, which we always do, or almost always do, is the following. The uh, so-called economic recovery uh, got weaker in the month of April. The statistics are now out for that month from the Federal Reserve and the Commerce Department. So we were rolling along reasonably well with corporate profits, with industrial production, with the stock market. Uh, those things had recovered. Uh, but the uh, unemployment, which had begun to get a little better, had dropped, I think, to 8.8%, is now back up to 9%, so that's gotten worse. The housing foreclosures have gotten significantly worse. Industrial production, which was up 0.7% uh, on a lot in the month of March, uh, was not, not at all in the month of April, it was stalled out, it was flat. So that, that's very bad in terms of the situation in the economy. Uh, economists polled beforehand, just to give you the deep respect that that professional deserves, uh, economists had confidently predicted an increase of 0.4%, there was an increase of nothing at all, so so much for the predictions. Uh, between March and April, the number of housing starts fell by 11%. That's enormous. Uh, and that indicates that the uh, housing industry remains deeply depressed. We are running at housing construction way below what would be necessary to get us back to some sort of reasonable level of housing construction. So that operates as a major drag on the economy. There are now above 3 million uh, houses on the market for sale, which is a huge number in the United States, and that keeps depressing the price as the people trying to sell have every incentive to drop the price further, which lowers the price of next door properties, etc., etc., in the usual way that markets uh, work. I thought you might be interested in one of the important numbers each month, the pound, the Japanese yen, and so on. And I thought you'd be interested from June 7th of 2010 to April 29th of 2011, the dollar declined against this basket of important currencies by 18%. That's a lot. That means for the United States that a foreigner could get 18% more dollars for a unit of his or her currency now than they could before. It also means that you all, any of you planning to go to Europe this summer, <laughs> you're going to have to pay 18% more dollar to get a euro or a British pound or so on. It's going to be much more expensive for you because the dollar is declining. Now the irony is the dollar's decline is actually, for production in the United States, good news. Because it means our exports, what we sell to the rest of the world, is cheaper because it, they have to give less of their currency to get a dollar, and so a dollar priced American good is cheaper for them. And, and sure enough, uh, in the months of uh, April, the exports of the United States rose 4.6 percent, which is a sizable increase in our exports. What that means, since that's been going on for some time, is that even though we're not producing goods and services for the United States, we here in America we work. We are producing them for people elsewhere. And that continues a trend of the United States becoming a place that buys a lot from the rest of the world and produces a lot for the rest of the world, but is decreasingly producing for itself. And that's something to think about, but that will have a lot of implications later. So I think it's fair to say that the recovery continues weaker than before, having left out the mass of people because of unemployment and housing foreclosures and so on. If I had time, but I don't, I'd go through a lot of other statistics. When you have unemployment as high as this, wages never go up. So American wages are very flat or declining because the unemployment makes it impossible. A person leaves their job, there's all those unemployed people who will jump to take it in their place. Uh, so the wages are not going anywhere. And I'm going to get to it a little bit later. Certain prices, particularly the prices of medical everything and energy and food, those three areas are shooting up in the way of prices. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit. I'll talk to you about what that involves and what it means. 
But if you put it all together, an economy where the production isn't going up, the wages are flat, but the prices are pushing up, is an economy that's going to be eating at people's standard of living because they don't have more to pay, and yet they don't have more with which to pay, but the prices they're required to pay keep going up. So this is the, the squeeze on the American people, and I'm going to give you some dramatic numbers a little bit later, uh, continues. And therefore the upset and the anger and the rage, uh, those continue, um, continue as well. Uh, okay, yes? The weakening of the dollar, would that also be pushing the price of that? Yes, the weakening of the dollar, I'm sorry, good point. The weakening of the dollar does also, because if you have to give more money, more dollars to get foreign currency, then everything that comes in from the rest of the world is more expensive to us. Even if the euro price of something, or the Japanese yen price of something is fixed, we're going to have to pay more and more dollars to get the yen to buy that fixed price item. And so yes, the things are becoming more expensive to us. Yeah. Um, you said that the unemployment was 8.8 .8 or 9 percent. Is that? But that's not the real unemployment number, though. Right? No, that's the official number. 8.8 .8, number before 9. Point, uh, 9 .0, I believe now. That's the official number and only counts adults looking for work and unable to find it and answering that question. In the past, I've given you this other number, which I prefer to use, and many economists of all political persuasions prefer to use because the Bureau of Labor Statistics in Washington issues a number of unemployment numbers. So when you read a story about the Bureau of Labor Statistics today said the unemployment rate was X, they're counting on you not to know what I'm about to tell you. There are multiple unemployment rates, not just one. So one of them is the one I quote, because it's the one most often quoted, the 9% adults unable to find work. Excuse me, I'm a modern person which means I can't work my machines. <laughs> um, they issue many because there's many different ways of counting the unemployed and many different kinds of unemployment to count. So the, the U6 is the one I prefer, and the U6 is the following. The number of people, adults, looking for work, unable to find it, that's that 9% number I just gave you, plus the number of people who are Voluntar excuse me, part-time employees, but not voluntarily so. These are people who want a full-time job, but were unable to find it. And the third group are the, you'll love this phrase, discouraged workers. Those are defined by the government as people who have stopped looking for work. It's not that they are out of the labor force, they would like a job, but they are so discouraged by not being able to find it. When you put those three groups together, U6, officially, 15% of the labor force. So it's probably a better measure of the number of people that are in a distressed situation, since most of those people are bringing home nothing, and one part of it is bringing home part-time rather than full-time income. So yes, that, that, can, that situation is very bad, very high by historical standards, and indicates a recovery that is not uh, touching most people, as it clearly isn't. If I had more time, I'd also talk to you a little bit about the psychology that this implies. Because what's going on here is you're telling people day after day in the media, there's a recovery. But these are people in whose own personal lives, there is no recovery. Now, people who may not be conscious have to process these two pieces of information. We are in a recovery, but I'm not. We are all in a recovery, but I'm not. Then the question is how do you how do you work that out? How do you explain this to yourself? And one American way to do this is to blame yourself for having a flaw that disables you from participating in the recovery everybody tells you is all around you. But it's not healthy. And you can see the evidence of that all over the place. Uh, next, talking so much for the general overview, let's now deal with some of the particular things that happened. I thought, since we've talked about it before, and many of you seemed interested, to bring you up to date on Greece, the country Greece. And not just because I'm interested in Greece, although I am, uh, or that it's an important country for all kinds of reasons, which it is, but because it's also, what I'm about to tell you about Greece, as you'll see, applies not only to other European countries, obvious ones like Portugal and Spain and Ireland and so on, Hungary, but also because, as you'll see, it applies even more generally. So let me start with the specifics of Greece, and then I'll bring it and make it more general so you'll see the impact. 
Um, Greece has been having an economic uh, crisis now for several years. The crisis that hit here in the late part of 2007 hit in Greece. Uh, but Greece had been playing a game again, like many other countries do, which is part of the way capitalism works. Uh, if you recall from an earlier session, and I'll be brief about summarizing it again, the government in capitalist countries is always, whatever else is it's doing, is torn between two communities. On the one hand, the mass of people. On the other hand, the very rich and the business community. And these two groups look at the government in the same way, but demand things that the government can't do at the same time. Basically, each of these two groups wants the government to do lots of things for them, but not pay them in the way of paying taxes. So corporations do everything they can do to get out of paying taxes. Rich people do everything they can do to get out of paying taxes. The mass of people who have less resources, nonetheless, use them as best they can to get out of paying taxes. Meanwhile, they demand. The corporations want the subsidies and the bailouts and all the rest that they get. Rich people like it. This is impossible for the government. How is it going to meet everyone's needs? The business community, the rich, they depend on them for the money to run their own personal political careers as well as the government. <coughs> or the mass of people, you know, depend on them for the votes, otherwise you don't get in to be the government. So you have to please these two constituencies by not taxing either of them and spending lavishly on them. How are you going to do that? Well, one solution is to take a clear side, to stick it to one group for the benefit of the other. That, that engages a kind of economic civil war which in the past has sometimes led to the other kind of civil war, and that's frightening. So the much easier path the politicians take is to solve this problem by borrowing money. By borrowing the money, you can do what each side wants without taxing them. This is a little bit like the glee-filled person who can't afford all the clothes he or she wants, but who receives from mommy a credit card. Whereupon magic begins to happen, I can use this credit card and I'm not out of any money because there isn't any there. Uh, you, know, you know people like that? Well, there are nations like that. Greece is one of them. By far not the only one, or not the worst one, but it did a lot of that. A lot of politicians solved their problem. And it's a peculiar solution because you have to ask the question, where does the government borrow from? And the joke here is, it borrows mostly from the very rich and corporations it didn't tax. Because they're the only ones who have the money to lend to the government. So the irony is the rich get a double benefit from this. They don't have to pay taxes to get the government services. And they get to take that money they didn't pay in taxes and lend it to the government instead, who has to repay them with interest. And this is wonderful for wealthy folks. For poor people, they don't pay much attention the mass of the working class. They're so happy that their taxes didn't go up and that their services are kind of being delivered, they don't look at the implications, which politicians have long ago figured out, so that's why they go in this direction. And if there isn't enough money in your own country to have the government borrow, no fear. You go out of the country. Greece, for example, borrowed more and more in recent years from German and French banks who were more than happy to lend them money. So the Greek government was able to play this game by borrowing first from its own wealthy, and secondly, from French and German, and European and British, and even some American banks to help fund this business. Of course, over time, if this is how you solve your problem, if you're a government in a capitalist society, you're going to run out of the ability to keep doing that, because, of course, the more you borrow each year, the bigger the debt, and you have to pay interest on the debt. It's like discovering that a credit card allows you to buy a lot this month, the next month, and next month, but then slowly over time, you notice that that number of interest that you owe is going up. So by 2007, the poor Greek government had two terrible problems to face. One, the amount of interest it had to pay on the accumulated debts of previous decades was already a major drag on the economy, because the government now had, in addition to paying for the services to the wealthy and the corporations and the people, it had to pay interest to everybody. 
so the government was feeling the weight of it. They might have been able to muddle along another decade, but they got a, a double whammy. Because in 2007, when the economies of the world tanked and lots of Greek businesses shrank, like everywhere in the world, those Greek businesses who laid off workers and those Greek businesses who got smaller paid less taxes. That was too much. They had the extra money to spend as the government for the interest on all the borrowing, and they had less money coming in. And they were now in serious trouble. First reaction to the serious trouble, and then this is really a lesson that I finance, which isn't very hot, but here's how it works. The lenders all over the world, who are mostly French banks, German banks, a few other banks, and some very rich institutions that decided to lend money to the Greek government, they get nervous. Those are the people who pay an economist like me to keep track of these things and to let them know the Greek government is in trouble, they're not getting enough money, and they're either going to have to stick it to their own rich people, corporations, and masses by cutting services to free the money to pay their debt, their creditors, or they're going to have to do the equally unpopular raising of taxes on their people to raise the money to pay the creditors. And the creditors are smart enough to know that in that situation, especially a government that is socialist in name, which it is in Greece, Socialist Party is the government, subject to the pressure of the mass of people, might decide to not pay back the national debt. <coughs> And the creditors who see all this much sooner than everybody else, the creditors are already worrying about that two to three months before the New York Times carries a story to let the rest of us know that this is an issue. And here's what the creditors do. They say to the Greek government, uh, you know, Greek government, how every six months or a year the old loans come due, you, you get us to roll them over. That is, you get us to extend the loan for another year or another five years. We will extend it this time, but not the interest rate we did last time with you, which was 4%, but now it's going to be 8% or 10%. Why? Because the creditors know that there's now much more risk in lending to the Greek government. So they demand much higher interest rate. Well, this, of course, makes the problem for Greece worse. They now have to pay out even more interest. They couldn't even do what they were supposed to do before. And, there's no, and so they're going to get in worse shape, which will make creditors nervous. So let me give you the information. A two-year loan to the Greek government today, right now, will get you 24% per year. That's the interest rate. A 10-year loan to the Greek government today will get you 16%. So try to think a minute. You can borrow money here in the United States for one, two percent. And you can lend it to the Greek government for 24 percent. That's an extraordinary difference. The two-year loan, the two-year bond issued by the German government, which is just a few hundred miles from the Greek government, is three percent. The two-year bond of the Greek government, a few hundred miles away, is 24 percent. This is impossible for Greece, and they begin to fall apart because Everything they do makes their situation worse, and they're going to fall apart. And the great problem is, they're now going to fall apart, and they're not going to have any other solution other than either to hit their people with a, try to get a sense of this, you would have to tax people twice what they're paying now, three times what they're paying now to carry this debt. That's politically impossible. Or you really have to go after the business community and the rich, and that's politically impossible. So what's beginning to emerge is that the Greek government is going to have to, and this is the word, default. It's just going to say to the people around the world, to the banks around the world, we owe you X billion dollars. Hello, we don't. <laughs> no. uh, well, it's very serious. This happens from time to time. This is not all that unusual. It happens over and over again. But it freaks everybody out, not just because the Greeks might do it, but of course, if the Greeks do it, then what is the me and they get away with it? What is the message to the Portuguese who are in the same situation, or the Spanish, or the Irish, or the British? 
Icelanders. The Icelanders are in the process of trying to figure out how to do it, but not quite. It's a little different there. But we'll save that for another another occasion. Let me finish with Greece. Um, so the IMF and the European banks come to the rescue. They want to help Greece. They say, and so the IMF and the European Union. I know saying IMF is not a dirty word, but it wasn't when I first developed this idea. And we can talk about that later. Um, talk about that later. Uh, the IMF rescues Greece, and basically all the IMF does is says to the Greeks, we understand you're in terrible shape. We understand that the options ahead of you are impossible. So we're going to do what the private market doesn't do. We will lend you a lot of money at a much lower, 5%. I believe it was 5%. Well, that's very helpful to Greece. It still leaves Greece in a terrible bind. They're not paying 3% like the Germans, but they're going to get 5 and that's a lot, lot, lot better than 15 or 20. So the Greek government really has no choice and accepts the European Union and the IMF. <clears throat> but now come the politics. The European Union and the IMF, that's the collection of all the European countries. In all of those countries, people are suffering. They have unemployment, the government is cutting back benefit. Everybody is feeling pinched by the crisis. And they're turning to their own governments and saying, help me. And the government's saying, I can't do it. Economic crisis, you can't do that. Then they wake up one morning and they read in the newspaper that their government that contributed X billions of dollars to the European Central Bank and to the IMF that that money is now going to go to Greece. Hello, say the German workers and the French workers and the other. Uh, what are we? That's our country's money, let's get that clear, is going to go help the bad economic crisis in Greece. But we have an economic crisis here. You told us 12 different ways that there's no money to help us. You're helping them. This is impossible. This is impossible. That puts the European governments, led by France and Germany, because they're the dominant players in Europe now, that puts them in an impossible bind. They can't help Greece out, because it'll destroy them politically at home. But they can't not help Greece out. Why? Because if they, this is crucial for you to understand, if they don't help Greece, then Greece may default on its debts. Well, who has the debts? French and German banks. So if the Greek government defaults, the French and German banks are out billions and billions of dollars. But those banks are very shaky. They have been requiring government help. And if the Greeks default, let alone if the Portuguese and the others do, then the French and German governments will have to bail out their own banks. And believe me, if you think their own people are angry at helping Greeks, they'd be more angry at helping the banks again. <laughs> so that neither the French government nor the German government wants to do that. So what are they, they have to help the Greeks because it's really helping themselves. But they can't help the Greeks. And solution. They help the Greeks and they punish the Greeks. They issue big statements. We're going to help you, but you have to shape up. You cannot continue to do, you cannot be so lavish with your pensions. You cannot be so lavish with the daycare programs. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Governments have to cut the programs, lay off workers. By the way, for those of you that have a chance to go to Europe and travel, visit France, visit Italy, and visit Greece. You'll see real quickly which of those countries is rich and which of those countries isn't. <coughs> Greece immediately shows you it's a much poorer country than those other two. Taking five minutes to figure that out. Five minutes. So here are, let's get it clear, two rich countries demanding to punish the standard of living of a much poorer country. That's what's going on. And so Greece has been doing that. Because the opposition in Greece Greece, trade unions, radicals, who have had seven general strikes in the last year, seven, who have had demonstrations virtually every week, often quite, quite aggressive and even sometimes violent. But the government, being a socialist government, is pushing this through. Been doing it for three years now. 
dramatic cuts in salaries for public employees and also private, layoffs of significant numbers, but here's the sad story of Greece. If you lay off large numbers of people, then of course your income tax is going to go down. And if you crunch your businesses, there are tax revenue to go. So whatever the government might have gotten before is undone by the consequences of what the government had to do to get the loan. So they get the loan, but it doesn't solve the problem because of the punishment, which has to happen because of the politics. So where is Greece today? Headline this afternoon, I thought I'd bring you something hot off the press. For the first time, the European leaders in France and Germany agree that Greece will have to, but they don't use the word, not default, but we were going to have to restructure the loan. What that means is, if you had a debt, the Greek government say had a four-year loan that was owned by the Bank of France, they're going to rewrite it as a 10-year loan. Why? Because then the monthly payment of interest and amortization is less. So the first effort will be to try to get out of the box by reducing the amount of money the Greek government has to come up with every year and hoping nobody notices that the flip side of a restructuring like that is you pay less per year, but you pay for many more years. And then the hope is that this slithers through politically, especially if the Greek leader, Mr. Papandreou, runs around the country telling everybody that this isn't so bad and every alternative is worse. But notice, nothing fundamentally is changing here. You are punishing the Greek people, people, the mass of people with cut services, cut employment, and everything else, in order to keep the financial system going and above all the French and German banks who own, own the debt. Now that brings me to an interesting initiative that a number of Greek uh, radicals have undertaken. And that is very interesting and that you may not know of and I want to stress with you. Um, in Greece, the radicals came up with an idea. They proposed and they are now pushing a debt, debt audit commission. A debt audit commission. And the interesting thing is to figure out, before I tell you what it is, where they got the idea. And they got the idea, it shows you how a how the world is a small place now, from the Latin American country, Ecuador. <laughs> Ecuador. And I want to get this right, that's why I'm looking at the paper. Uh, in 2007, the president of Ecuador, Mr. Correa, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, established a debt audit commission in Little Ecuador, because Little Ecuador is a small country in Latin America, was having a terrible problem with its debts particularly its debts to American banks and British banks and Spanish banks, which were squeezing the country because they were having to stick it to their people like the Greeks are to pay off all these loans. So the ESTAP, he's a new leader, he's a president, but he's a president of a different kind, as is happening in so many Latin American countries. He established a debt audit commission and he said the following, I am not going to permit, as the president of Ecuador, that we squeeze our people for the benefit of the creditors without first ascertaining two things. One, were these debts legitimately entered into by previous governments? Because if they weren't, then we're not obligated to pay. And for you to think about this, this is very similar to what is happening in the foreclosure market in American housing, where it turned out, if you remember over the last year or so, we learned that banks took shortcuts and didn't properly sign the document and process the document. And lots of people who were forced out of their homes have gotten their homes back because they could demonstrate the illegality of the foreclosing procedures against them. So that's all this is. And so Correa began in 2007, uh, set up this commission, and discovered that a huge portion, I don't remember the percentage, but I think it was between 30 and 40% of the government's debt was, in the statement of the president, illegitimately entered into. And then, of course, the key point. Therefore, we're not going to pay it. <laughs> so now there are people, banks and insurance companies, who invested in the Ecuadorian debt, usually handled by a broker, 
a dealer who works those deals out. One of the most famous brokers who does these deals around the world, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, the same players again. And there was something wrong with this. The information wasn't correct, but it wasn't done right. And Ecuador refused and got out of a huge portion. So this idea worked well. And for those people who thought that, that when they were going through this, the banks, particularly in the United States, said, if you do that, we will never lend you money again. Your economy will collapse. The, the whole kind of, you mustn't, you mustn't, you mustn't. And the threat that's always involved in these statements, which is the last topic for today, these threats I'm going to come back to. But Ecuador persevered, went through with it, and here's the numbers for, for last year in this. In 2010, uh, Ecuador registered an economic growth of 3.7% in its GDP, much higher than the United States, and this year is scheduled to rise 5%, also much higher than the United States. So the, the predictions of gloom and doom for Ecuador, if they took this radical step, proved to be empty. And now in Greece, there's a movement to do it. I don't know if you remember when, you, when the Greek story was in the press, but one of the reasons Greece has a particular problem is that a very complicated financial deal was worked out to allow Greece to borrow in the last four, 2004, five, and six. That deal, with very arcane instruments, was brokered by Goldman Sachs, who was hired by the Greek government and paid enormous commissions to work all this out, to enable the Greek government to borrow. It is highly likely that a careful look at all of this will determine shenanigans of one kind or another, or excess commissions, or kickbacks, because these are not so unusual in these kinds of deals anyway. And it's going to give the Greek government, if they do it, it's putting the, the socialist government in a very difficult place, because the less is demanding this, it's just an audit to see. But of course, the unspoken underneath this, which makes it such a sophisticated political move, is basically what the left is doing is saying, we shouldn't just be discussing how to squeeze from our people the money to pay the creditor. Because that has terrible social consequences, and here comes the key point. We should be weighing the consequences from doing that against the social consequences of instead of making the mass of people pay and suffer, to make the creditors pay and suffer. That ought to be a democratically arrived at decision. Because the borrowing that made money, that saved the, the Greek government from its difficulty, was also lending that made a lot of money for somebody else. So the two sides were at least equally complicit. And maybe if they were both complicit, they ought both to bear some of the burden. Now, why is this interesting? Think of it. This is applicable to us. Our government, Republicans and Democrats alike, are now saying we must cut the deficits and the debt of the United States. Some of you noticed, I think it was yesterday or today, we officially hit our debt ceiling. And under the law of the United States, the government has to pass a law. The Congress has to pass a law to allow the government to borrow more than the ceiling, which we've now reached at. So theoretically speaking, if the Republicans who have been making noises like this were actually to vote against in the House of Representatives, not allow the debt ceiling to be raised, it would mean the United States government couldn't borrow another nickel. If the United States government can't borrow another nickel, it can't fund roughly 35% of what it's now doing. Well, that's roughly a third. So we're, let's see, we're currently involved in four wars, and one of them would have to go. <laughs> but one third less. And one third of our, this may scare some of you, Every third, we'll do a symbol system, and every third Medicare person will be asked to quietly die. <laughs> and, you know, every, med every third Medicaid person will be, uh, you know, shown the door, etc., etc. So it's very nerve-wracking if you actually take this stuff seriously. It's mostly theater, so I wouldn't worry much about it. But the government is using this argument to say, we must cut back. 
Social Security is threatened. Medicare is clearly going to be reduced. Medicaid is already being slashed all over the country. We have to cut back, just like Greece, in order to keep paying the creditors. The government doesn't say a word. But see, uh, we have to economize on the debt so we won't pay our creditors one out of every three dollars. Oh, no. That is as if it were sacrosanct. As if uh, a deity, if you, if you believe in one, was sitting there saying, you can't do that. You must pay the creditor. By the way, in every court in the United States today, there are many cases in which debtors refuse to pay creditors. And the courts work that. That's a normal part of business. But in our political life, it is an impossible thing to do. Suppose here in the United States there was a left. <laughs> and I don't mean that quite as harshly as it sounds, but almost. Uh, suppose we had a real left in America which would be able to push a debt audit commission. Let's inquire, just as we did with foreclosures, how these debts were worked at. How did the big banks manage to lend all that money to the United States government? What enormous commissions did they get? And if you have any doubt about the commissions they get and the high life of these people, you did notice, even though you were reading it for other reasons, that the head of one of the most important international financial institutions was staying at the Sofitel Hotel a few blocks from here, and at, if I understood correctly, at a, at a room, or a set of rooms that cost $3,000 a night. Um, and uh, he was yanked off an airplane where he occupied a position in the first class section, which if you know is a lot more expensive than sitting in steerage or whatever they call that. <laughs> um, so this is a man who lives nicely. And he's a socialist. And he's also yeah. a socialist. I mean, until this happened, he was the, the odds-on favorite to run against Sarkozy and likely beat him. So this, this is a person, but... Right now, he's at, in a financial institution, and that's how financial institutions live. So if we had a debt audit commission, here's what we would have in the United States. We would have a chance to at least politically put on the table the costs and benefits for us all democratically to decide between paying or not paying the creditors, some or all of what we owe them, versus the damage done to millions of people by all these cutbacks. Because that's a real choice we have. But it's not a real choice in American politics because it's not understood and it's not seen and the options that other countries are already using. By the way, there's a movement in Ireland to have a debt audit and it's really catching on. It's a strong movement in Greece. It's a not quite so strong, but moving in Ireland. And it already was successful in Ecuador. And I'm no expert in many other countries. I don't even know about where this is moving. But I thought you would be interested to see how this situation in Greece uh, is developing. The problems are getting worse, but the in ingenuity and motion of the left in dealing with it is also developing. And there's a sophistication there, and there's a, a pressure, very interesting. And not the least important is that Europeans are learning new tactics of the left from Latin Americans. And that too is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, so okay. Next topic for our update, oil and gas prices. As all of you know, I assume, they are high. Uh, they're about a dollar a gallon, a bit more than a dollar a gallon, higher than they were a year ago, which is a lot. I see here on the way down, I walk by a gas station, what was it? Four and a half bucks, more or less, uh, for a gallon of gas. Um, what's, what's all that about? Well, if you listen to the testimony of the companies, uh, this is the cost of doing business. It's very expensive, if you listen to them, to explore for petroleum and to find it and to bring it up out of the ground and to refine it. Blah, 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 blah. So I thought it would be interesting, and I do try to do this from time to time, to make all this personal. Uh, I got the latest documents dated April 13th this year from the Exxon Mobil company. That's the biggest oil company uh, in the United States. Um, and to tell you where some of the money that you're paying for gas goes. 
I want to introduce you then to R.W. They don't give the name, just the initials. R.W. Tillerson, Mr. Tillerson, Chairman and CEO of uh, Exxon. In 2010, his compensation package, nice term, was $28,952,558. So I did the arithmetic, and that works out to a little over $500,000 a week. But it's, I counted all 52 weeks. I'm quite sure he has a vacation. But during his vacation, he still gets the $500,000 a week. Um, last year, he got $27,168,000. Uh, $27, and in 2008, three years ago, he got $32 million. So um, just roughly 60, 80, $90 million over the last three years was his take-home pay, which, as you probably can realize, is more than yours. Um, the senior vice president, because Mr. Tillerson is not alone, the senior vice president is DD, that two, Two letters D, not D E E D E E. D D Humphreys, and his take-home pay was much less than Mr. Tillerson's. Probably feels really small in Mr. Tillerson's presence. He got thirteen and a half million last year, eleven point eight million the year before, and sixteen point three million in two thousand and eight. Not bad. Mr. Dolan, Mr. Kramer, and Mr. Pryor, the three next down, also got never less than $30 million over the last three years. So everybody got the, the top five officials who are the only ones they are required by law to list the top five income earning uh, executives. So otherwise I can't get more information, but this is the legal information the Securities and Exchange Commission requires from them. So I know the salaries of the top five pay. So all of them earned over the last three years, 30 to $90 million each. No, no, that includes, includes everything. <coughs> includes everything that's public. <coughs> My guess is if they have to take a car someplace, they probably don't call an enterprise. <laughs> they probably do that. And if there's a plane ride they need to take, they probably don't go to JFK. And they probably don't wait in line like you do. But that's because, obviously, if you get paid that much more, they must be that much more productive than you are. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair, and that's not possible. Um, so let, let me talk a little bit about oil and gas prices, besides what they pay for. And believe me, if the salaries are wild of what they get, and it's true all the way down the management ladder, so too are all the other expenses. I mean, if you take a look at their corporate headquarters, the shrubbery alone is more than you earn a year. And I just think a minute. It's 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 happy time at the big company. You pay for it, but they enjoy it. Okay. Let's examine this. Okay. First, um, why is this happening? You couldn't possibly justify it on grounds of supply and demand. Why? Because the world now has an ex I know this may come as a shock to some of you, a major excess of oil and petroleum. It is being stored all over the world because they can't sell it. Normally, in the laws of supply and demand, if the supply is greater than the demand, the price is going to come down. I know that must be true because I teach that. <laughs> and I wouldn't tell a lie. But it isn't happening. And so, all kinds of really sharp minds who learned about supply and demand are wondering how you account for a rise in price when the supply and demand are such that it should go the other way. And we have an answer. If you're an extremely conservative person, you have the same answer you always have to explain everything in the world that is unpleasant. The government did it. But I'm going to put that one aside because that, that's kind of silly because it doesn't explain why the government. For them, it's enough, the government did it, therefore it's bad. But, you know, I'm assuming that we're all 
if not very sophisticated, at least not conservative. Given that it's the best form, it's probably a safe bet. Okay. So what's the other explanation, particularly beloved by radicals and leftists, of whom, as you know, I am one? Speculation. This is a word that rolls off the tongue easily. It, it, it conjures up an image of an evil person lurking in the corner, taking advantage of things to make our lives more difficult. Are there people who buy oil and gas who do not buy it in order to heat their homes or run their cars or who just buy it as a hustle, trying to buy it at a low price and then try to sell it at a... Of course there are. The reason that exists is because that's what a market system always does and always has done. If you have a market, if the price is determined by the ups and downs of supply and demand, then everybody who is a buyer of whatever bounces up and down is sooner or later going to figure out, don't be an idiot. To, pre to prevent yourself from being destroyed, because at the moment you go out to buy something that you need, the price is high, it would be really smart for you to buy oil when it's low and put it aside so you can get it when the price is high because you won't have to then pay the price, right? Everybody does. That's what markets make people do. Let me say that again. Markets make people do something strange. Think of it this way, millions, and I mean that, millions of buyers of oil and gas have every incentive in a market system to buy more of it than they need and store it. Which means if a lot of people buy more than they need and store it, then the price is going to go up because they're buying more than they need to store it. So if people think that there's going to be a problem in the world of buying oil, they're going to do what they do with it if there's going to be a problem in buying anything. They're going to buy it and store it, calculating that I know what it's going to cost me to buy it and store it. I have to pay for the storage. But then I know my parameters, and I'm not going to get blindsided by a sudden spike in the price that could wipe me out if I need to buy oil at the right time. Now. What have we got in the world going on over the last year? Let's see, we have a war in Afghanistan, a war in Iraq, and a war in Pakistan, and a war in Libya, all of which have something to do with oil. oil. And if any of those countries blows up, oil is going to be interrupted, the flow of oil. And that means there's going to be a shortage. And if there's going to be a shortage, the price is going to go up. So what do people do if it isn't there yet, but it looks like it's coming? You buy and store oil. Now, if you like, you can call it speculation. It's all right to be called spaghetti. I don't care. The point is, if you don't want that to happen, then what you're doing is you're objecting to how the market system works, for which you make it a jail sentence in our society. Markets are presented by my colleagues in every university in America as a spectacular institution of stunning efficiency. The greatest invention of the human mind to get a medium wonderfully efficient. What? I just explained to you that it is in the nature of a market to produce what we call speculation. Because, of course, the only people who are going to buy and store gas and oil are not just the ones who are going to buy it. Because other people say, oh, I'm smart, I can see, price of oil could go very high, and I'm going to get some now and sell it. I'm not in the business, I don't need it ever. I'm just looking to make some money. All markets have always worked like that. But what we're doing, when you hear the language of speculator, what you're hearing is often, and it's unconscious on the part of the people who speak it. It's a way to be critical of the consequence of markets 
without holding the market to blame. It's an invention of an ideologically driven society that cannot face that markets are at best a mixed affair in terms of what they do. They're not the great achievement of brilliant efficiency, and nothing of the sort. They have, like every other institution, positives and negatives. And one of the negatives is you can have a situation like now where in a world in which there's more oil than we need to use, the price is going like this. That's a consequence of markets. Nor will I torture you, although I could, by telling you all the consequences of an absurdly, irrationally high price of oil. Shall I tell you about the immense waste of resources storing oil that should have been left under the ground? What are we doing? That's craziness. Should I tell you about all the people who cannot do all kinds of things because they can't afford four and a half dollars a gallon of gas? The medical insurance company, some of you noticed the, the article on the front page of the New York Times four or five days ago. Medical insurance companies are making wild profits. And when some research was done on how come they're doing so well, the answer was they assumed when they charged their premiums and everything, and when your employer pays for the medical care, they assumed that people in 2011 would be going to the doctor on the same rough schedule that they had in the past. But they're discovering, happy, 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 that Americans are not going to the doctor. And there were two reasons given why they're going systematically less. Number one, the medical insurance companies have hassled everybody, and you all know this, not covering this, not completely covering that, delaying that people don't want to deal with it. So they don't go for that checkup. They wait. More and more there's a, a copay or money you have to give yourself for whatever the insurance comes, you have the deductibles and all that, so they don't go. But here's another reason. In many parts of the country, to go see a specialist, you have to drive a distance. It's too expensive to drive the car. People are, are saying, I, I can't go 40 miles each way to get an MRI or whatever it is I need, and I, I can wait a few months. They are killing people this way. The, the, the real cost of a jack-up in the price of oil on this scale can be counted also in life and death, as well as an enormous waste of resources. It's an amazing phenomenon. And by the way, were the United States to suddenly stop its four wars, were there actually to be, I don't know, peace in the Middle East, why not entertain the fantasy? You could see a collapse in the price of oil that would be as damaging to many economies as the rise is now. This is an irrational way of organizing our basic energy. A society that uses this random bouncing up and down with everybody playing in a market and guessing and counter-guessing, to call that the sum total of human creative efficiency <laughs> is an insult to the human race. The idea that you couldn't do better planning, by the way, the, you think that big companies depend on the rise and fall of price of oil to take care of their energy needs? None of them do that. They all have an ready? economic planning department <laughs> whose job it is to make either long-term contracts with oil, that's the major way it's done. They cut a deal with Exxon, not the way you and I can go up to the pump, pay what it costs, no, no, no. They make a five or a ten-year contract to get a delivery of so much oil per year at a fixed price because, if you ask them, because we don't want to be at the mercy of the market. <laughs> That's what they say. That's what they say. They understand that the market is their enemy. Even though the executive of the company, on the day of the Kiwanis speech downtown, will stand up and talk lofty language, or as close to that as an executive can get, uh, about the joys of the market, the wonderful influence. He wouldn't subject this company to it. That's really all for you to do. All for you to think about. So speculation is, is a fake word. It's an attempt to make something unusual and atypical and strange and vague and nicely separated from the supply and demand of every market. But that's absurd because that speculation is just a word for what every market generates. 
And that's by the way, by the way, done in every commodity. In every commodity in the world, there is this kind of thing. Some more, some less. But there's nothing unique about energy. Last thing. You were treated, I'm sure some of you must have caught it, over the last week to a wonderful piece of that quintessential theater in the United States known as the Congress. And they had a hearing. The Democrats were pushing this, and they summoned the heads of five or six of our major oil companies. And they scolded them, they shook the finger, this finger, not the other finger, uh, because they're polite, polite, at least on TV they're polite. They shook the finger and they said, you know, we're very angry, the American people are very angry at you, um, because you're charging these very high prices for oil and gas, and we are completely horrified, and so, here comes, so the Democrats, led by our president, came charging forward and said, you oil companies are currently getting, now here's the numbers, because the numbers matter here, you are currently getting, and this is true, subsidies and tax loopholes that basically funnel about four, four billion dollars a year to you. And at a time when you are earning wild amounts of profits, 10, 20, 30 billion dollars a quarter year, it's a little, and you're charging the American people an arm and a leg, it's a little kind of excessive for us to be subsidizing you. By the way, subsidies based on laws as old as 100 years ago, when these laws were passed to help oil companies find oil before they had it. Uh, that's not their problem now, as I told you, we have an oil block, not an oil shortage. So, the president was going to take back all four, no, that would be extreme, two. We're going to give you two. We're going to take back two. Two billion. <laughs> What's the impact of taking back two billion on the gas price? Zilch. Nothing. Zilch. Nothing. Not no one to Sundays. To make an alternative case would require you to be a magician with numbers and with rare skill at that. But just to show that he isn't being too partisan, our president one day earlier also announced he will allow drilling. Among other places, in the Gulf of Mexico. Very sensitive. Those people are still reacting from a year ago's disaster there, but they're going to allow more drilling. Is there a way to deal with the price of oil and gas and all that goes with it? If drilling is a horrific way to try to solve the problem, and if cutting subsidies from four to two is an insulting abuse of our intelligence as a nation? Yes. I think the answer is yes. And the answer is not new. It's very old. The two major, or if not the two major, two of the major uses of oil and gas in the United States are to run the private automobile, by far the single most important use, and to heat our homes. So the solution to the gas and oil price would be to do something on the demand end. That is, to finally bite the bullet and to do what most other countries are doing, and that is to construct a reasonable, well-financed, mass public transportation system. Railways under, uh, underground and above ground, vans, buses, all the ways, all of which easily can be shown, economize on oil. They use much, much less oil to move a person a mile in any of the collective ways of moving compared to the individual way of movement. And we likewise know that a proper insulation program for our homes, let alone a program of building group housing, would lower the cost of heating our situations. All of that is well documented by any kind of scientific thing. And here's the interesting thing. If we move to mass transit, Try to keep in your mind just some of the benefits. Number one, it's a major job creating program. You can put a lot of unemployed people to work building a mass transportation system of quality in this country, number one. Number two, the largest 
killer of a, the, the, the largest cause of death in the United States is not disease, it is the automobile and the accidents of the automobile. I don't know if you know, many more people die in car crashes and die in wars that the United States has fought. So we would do a major job of reducing death and injury because it's the major cause of those things. Number three, the single major cause of uh, air pollution in our culture is the private automobile. To move people by train in groups cuts down on less pollution, less death and injury, more jobs, and less reliance on oil. Hello? How often have you heard of a, of a proposition, of a proposal for what a country to do that brings you as many benefits as that at the same time? It's not interesting that you agree or disagree with what I just said. But keep in mind, in a country obsessed by excess prices for oil, by pollution, by unemployment, and presumably by the death and injury that car crashes cause, this is not being discussed. Neither are Republicans nor are Democrats. It's as if I had just had a blast of, of, of inspiration. This is an old idea. I didn't invent this. I've seen it a thousand times, reading literature over 50 years. The beauty of, of, the, of the power of ideology in this culture is what it makes disappear from the, from the framework of people's thinking. And not just the politicians who have an obvious interest because of who they'll offend, but also the mass of people who make that possible. And for those of you who might say, well, gee, if we did such a thing, wouldn't it hurt the automobile companies in the United States and the people who work there? Yes, it would. It would reduce the demand and therefore the production of automobiles. And in order to handle that properly, a rational society would have to plan for this transition. Be able to move the people who will no longer be needed for the automobile Although, believe me, the automobile companies have much of the technology that would be available to build the buses and the vans and the so forth to run in a mass transit system, but there will be some that will be laid off. These people might be given priority in the new industry of mass transit. They might be given some retraining. We could handle this situation, given the enormous social benefits from doing it and the relatively modest costs of accommodating it, it ought at least to be discussed and debated and, dare we say, decided in some democratic way by this society. Since the possibility of democratic decision might come with a result we don't want, the solution, make believe, it's not an issue. So on behalf of the car companies and the oil companies, thank you all for keeping that issue off the agenda. Next item. Perhaps as powerful an issue in the American mind in general, but particularly over the last month, has again become the issue of medical care, how to pay for it, how it's going to be done. There are many people believe, who now believe that it will be a major part of the presidential race over the next year and a half, that the Republicans think they have a great issue by having the American people angry at Obama and the Democrats for imposing this or that government health program on them, and the Democrats seem to also think that they can make it out that they're providing good medical care for the American people, and if you let the Republicans in, they'll take away the medical care. Neither of these is quite accurate, but, but when is that new? But that, that is going to be an issue. So I thought it would be important to bring to your attention uh, some information about all of this. And I am fortunate because I um, follow the career of, the, of a person who went to graduate school in economics with me many years ago, uh, actually a young man of German extraction named Uwe Reinhardt, Uwe Reinhardt. Uh, and he and I studied for our PhD comps together, um, but he was already then, looked a little askance at me because my leftism was beginning to show, and he was very careful to avoid any such illness uh, affecting him. Uh, and he went on, therefore, to become an important, famous person, unlike me. And uh, he's now a professor of medical economics at Princeton University. But he's a decent guy. And 
So he, he writes periodically, and it's good stuff. If, you, if you're interested, seriously, if you're interested in medical economy, the economics of the whole medical, there's nobody better that I know in the United States writing like this. Plus, being a professor at Princeton, he's you know, eminently quotable and citable as an authority. Uwe Reinhardt. And spelled R-E-I-N-H-A-R-D-T. And the first name, Uwe, U-W-E. I don't know how, how an American would pronounce U W E. U E? It's a mystery to me. But Uwe is how you want to pronounce it if you honor the German language. Okay. Um, he does research, and here's what he found. And I think you will find this extremely interesting and in explaining not only medical care but politics in the United States. Research has been done that he got a hold of uh, that looks at the following question. For an average family of four in the United States, checking across the, the 50 states and so forth and so on, an average family of four, what does it cost? How much money is spent on their medical care? How much money does it cost? And he, he said, I want to see all the payments. I want to see how much is paid by the employer for the, for the policy that covers you as a worker, whatever you work. How much is paid by your contribution to the medical insurance? And how much do you pay out of pocket? Add them all up. Get a complete sense of how much uh, is paid for your medical care. And here are the numbers, very simple. In, over the last decade, so I'm going to compare 2001 with 2011, the year we're in now. 2001, it was $8,414. That was the average annual total amount spent on the medical care of uh, an average American family of four. In 2011, same family, same size, same survey. The cost was $19,393. And then it moved there, because you know, if you're an economist, you have to learn how to do arithmetic. He calculated that this was an annual increase over 10 years, annual increase, of 8.8%. It went up. The cost, the total cost of the medical care a family got. Over the same period of time, same period of time, the average employee compensation, money paid to workers, was under 4%. In other words, the cost of medical care in the United States over the last 10 years is more than twice the rise in your capacity to pay. Which means that, of course, Americans should be freaked after 10 years of this, because what is going on is you are being required to pay much more for the medical care, and therefore other parts of your budget have to give. Unless you think, no, no, wait a minute, that's the employer. No, 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 because he does, he's a good economist, he understands. The more the employers have to pay to the insurance to cover the rising cost, the less wage increase you got at the time of the union negotiations. The employer is not going to give you 4% because he's going to sit there with your, with your bargaining committee if you have a union and he's going to say, I'm paying 7% or 8% more for your medical, I'm damn well not going to give you a 5% a wage increase, you'd be lucky I'd give you 1%. And the unions, since the numbers are correct, kind of being weak anyway, slink away. But the bottom line is then you're paying. You're paying in the salary increase you didn't get for this cost. Why is this interesting? Well, it's because in all the hoopla, this bottom line reality is not really taken seriously. What this means is that the basic cost of medical care, the doctor, the hospital, the medical equipment, and the drugs, those are the costs that are driving this system sky high. The insurance company then comes along and slaps on its profit to take the money and pay all these people. 
So you have to pay all the rising prices of the cost of the medical care plus the profit of the insurance company that handles all of the claims when you have need for this medical care. Now, something rising that fast, twice the rate of increase of people's income, you would think in a rational society that wasn't ideologically befuddled, that if you want to deal with the crisis of medical care, you wouldn't be saying, oh my God, we've got to cut back the Medicare because there's not enough money in the Medicare to pay for people. Stop! The reason there's not enough money is that the prices are rising out of control. That's not discussed. That's not discussed. We can't even get to the point of having a government insurance. And by the way, if the government ran it, if we had a single payer, Canadian style, or one of the others, we would still have the rising doctors, rising hospitals, rising drugs, rising medical equipment. But at least we wouldn't have to pay a high profit to a private insurer, because the government would do it at cost, the way other countries do. So that would be a, a cost containment. We couldn't get that. Although I do understand Bernie Sanders in Vermont has just introduced a bill for it, but anything in Bernie Sanders introduces is DOA, as they say in the Congress, is not going to survive very far, but it's good that he did it. So if we're going to deal with the medical crisis in the United States, again, notice the blinders. No discussion of the doctor and the hospital. Basically none. It's all in the hands of the private insurers. The private insurers, of course, could have if they were so inclined, squeeze down what they pay to the doctors. And all of that does go on. But the insurer, yes, they do that. And then the government does it through Medicare and Medicaid as well. If you look at the numbers that Uwe collects, it's astonishing. The American right wing is correct. Because the government basically says, we're not going to give you more than X, what they do is they stick it to the private patients. They recoup the profits they need from the private, in, private insured to offset what they're not getting from the Medicare and the Medicaid pay. That's correct. I mean, there's no point in leftists pretending that isn't true. In the crazy way our system works, believe me, if the government does something, it'll do it in such a way that will, in a sense, screw it up for itself. The United States government continually does that, and that's why you can't believe this is an accident. They continually do things in a way that make people angry at the government. That's a very self-destructive act. Why would you continue to be self-destructive? Normally, if you're an individual, you go for professional help in that situation. We just reproduce that because there's a lot of interest in the government in building hostility to itself. That's why we have the politics that we do. Nothing, though, on any kind of general level is being done uh, for to deal with the cost of the doctors, the cost of the hospitals, the cost of the drugs, and the cost of the medical equipment, and that keeps eating more and more and making people angry about their medical situation, furious, looking for somebody to blame because they don't understand what I've tried to go over with you. Just to finish up, I got the statement, the latest statement of the largest drug company in the United States, Merck, uh, dated April 13th, and once again they have to reveal who gets the money you pay for medicine and drugs? Well, let me introduce you to them. And Merck, unlike Exxon, gives you the name, not just the initials. So you're going to get the whole thing. Richard T. Clark. Name like the candy bar. He earned, uh, in 2010, $24,572,000. $871, the year before $15.8 million, the year before that $22.3 million. Peter Kellogg, uh, excuse me, Kenneth Fraser, sorry, Peter. Uh, Kenneth Fraser, first vice president, Peter Kellogg, Peter Kim, and Bruce Kulik all earned a minimum of $10 million all the way up to $50 million, between $10 and $50 million over the last three years. So the next time you're upset about spending a lot of money for those pills, it goes to a really worthy cause. A lot of people are taking home several hundred thousand dollars a week, 52 weeks of the year, year after year, to make it possible for you to pay those prices. If you wanted to control the price of medicine, how far would you have to go? 
And believe me, the shrubbery around the Merck headquarters, I believe in New Jersey, are stunning. Yeah. I really hope you brought the Morgan Stanley 10Q or 10K because those numbers are Yeah, they're bigger than that. The finance industry is a whole other level. I will do that next time. I will do that next time. <laughs> okay, last point for today. An issue that has come up over and over again in the United States, at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level, and internationally. And it goes something like this. A mayor in a city, a governor in a state, a president, a congress, here or in another country, decides, usually under pressure from the mass of people, to take away a subsidy and a tax loophole like the government is threatening to do to, to Exxon and the other oil companies. Or it wants to impose a tax on rich people or on corporations. Or in the case of many countries these days, uh, and one in particular, Argentina, the government imposes environmental protection regulations. Companies can't do this or that because it destroys the air or the water or the soil. And then an interesting thing happens. And you could see it last week with the oil companies. What begins to be articulated by the paid PR spokesperson for the company is fundamentally a threat. If you do this, president this, mayor that, well, much as it will pain us, we might have to, I don't know, move production to another country. Or if you're talking to a mayor, move production to the suburbs of your city, but pay taxes in the suburbs rather than to you here in the city. By the way, for those of you not familiar with recent American history, recent being the last 40 years, we have a mass exodus across the United States of businesses from cities, but they just move five miles across the boundary to the suburb because the taxes in the suburbs are much lower so that the company moving to the suburbs can hold on to its labor force. They just have to get in the car and drive five miles instead of driving two. They can hold on to their labor force. They can hold on to all their sales arrangements. They just save a ton of money on taxes. The suburbs are wonderful because they don't have any poverty. They don't have any of the expenses of a city, the road maintenance, the police force. <laughs> All of, so what do you have? You have the corporations, the businesses leaving the city. If the executives and the owners of the business hadn't already done it, they leave the city too for the same reason. They can buy a nicer house in the suburb and pay less taxes than the house they have in the city. So what you have over 50 years is the removal of the American business community and the, the, the wealthier people in city after city to the suburbs leaving behind those who can't afford to leave, who can't come to the suburbs, or who are actively kept out. That has shaped the, the dynamic of the city, the racial composition of the city, the politics of cities versus suburbs. It's an extraordinary process, and every city was unable to do anything because it couldn't tax the businesses because they threatened to leave. So it didn't tax them, they didn't have any money. That made the conditions in the city unpleasant, so the company wanted to leave the city. It was an impossibility. And it produced a vast shift in the United States from, we were an urban country in the 1930s. We became a suburban country after World War II. Radically altered the politics of the United States, the racial issues, the economic issues. Just put all that aside. Back to the basic thing. The businesses threaten. So the oil companies let it be known last week that if they didn't get this subsidy, a trivial amount of their income, so it's a silly threat, but it's interesting that they did. We might have to produce more oil elsewhere. We might have to shut our facilities here if we're not getting them. We might have to, you know, we don't want to, but we might have to. And the interesting thing about this is it's a straight-out threat. There's nothing so subtle here. It's, re it's really quite politely articulated often, but it's a threat. And the interesting thing is our American political system goes to the people and says, we would love to stick it to these companies, 
but we can't. Because if we dare do it, they would hurt us more than what it hurts us to do nothing. So this becomes a wonderful way for a politician to say to the people, I agree with you. We really should stick it to those oil companies, given what they're charging for it. But they can't. I'm protecting you with your situation because I'm avoiding their doing what they threaten to do. The interesting thing here is, and I wonder why I left it for last and why I want to stress it, it's again an ideological trap in the American mind. If you are threatened, if anybody's threatened, there are always two possible responses. One response is to cave in, be intimidated, and fold. It's like in a game of poker. If they bluff you, one thing to do is to fall. Um, but there's another option. And the other option is threaten them back. Let them know that what they might do to hurt you could in turn lead you to do something to hurt him. Why would you voluntarily forego this weapon after it's been used on you? Even if you have an ethical distaste for threatening, you might want to revisit your ethics after you got threatened. So let me give you an idea, just an idea, of some of the things the United States government, just to pick one, could do if threatened by the oil companies, by the drug companies who will produce drugs in other countries if we make it too unpleasant for them here, and so forth and so on. Let's go through. Number one, and, and this is just hypothetical, of course. President Obama calls a news conference, appears on nationwide television, and says, Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, we've been in discussions with the Exxon Mobil Oil Company, let's just pick them as a hypothetical, and we've asked them to lower their prices by 50 cents a gallon. That will still make them wildly profitable, but not quite as profitable as they were, but it will help the American people enormously to have 50 cents less to spend per gallon of gas. And the Exxon Mobil Company told us to go jump in the lake or words to that effect. So I want you all to know that as of tomorrow morning, the United States government will no longer buy any oil or any gas from the ExxonMobil Corporation. Every cheat in the army, every nuclear submarine, everybody who buys oil, and we in the American government, every truck run by the post office, every garbage truck across America that's a city operate, we will buy gas and oil, but not from you. That's how markets work. The government has the right to patronize whichever business they choose. Number, one. Number two, President Obama announces a trip across America where he's going to give a speech in every one of the 50 states. He's going to tell this story and explain himself to the American people. He's not going to call upon the American people individually to uh, make a decision like the government did. He only wants them to reach whatever decision they think is appropriate in the situation he's just described. <coughs> Long before he got on Air Force One to make the first speech, the president of ExxonMobil would be camping outside the White House on his knees asking for an opportunity to uh, discuss this issue. Please. Please. They can't have that. They can't, they, can't, they can't survive this. But I'm not done. Next step of the government. I'm also pleased to announce this morning, my fellow Americans, says President Obama, that in the event that other oil companies were disposed to join uh, ExxonMobil and make this an entire uh, oil industry opposition to me, that I am going to start tomorrow morning drawing up plans for a national oil company that will buy and refine oil in the United States so we cannot be blackmailed by the oil. Every one of those things is absolutely legal. 
Every one of those things is simply doing what people do in the face of market conditions that are not conceived to be acceptable. There is no reason why the United States government doesn't do that, because long before it would have to carry out any of those threats, the deal would be made. Exxon cannot be cut off like that. It would take them billions of dollars and 20 years to recoup the damage to their image. We could all go get gas from somebody else. And if they all did it, we'd all go get gas from the U.S. gas company, which will now have a station at every corner. Uh-uh. The only interesting question, my last point, the only interesting question is why the political structure cannot cognize what I just said. And the only answer is because the mass of the American people don't demand it either. So no more. So we will talk about the, the threat of the companies as if we were what? Unarmed? Unable to defend ourselves? Unable to counter threat? Of course we're able. And believe me, the government of the United States, like all governments, retains an enormous amount of power. It is not a weakling that cannot respond to corporations. That is an image that corporations have every interest in fostering. It's hopeless to struggle against them. They have all the cards. If you dare to do anything, they'll threaten you and then that. Come on. This is, this is a population that self-disarms in the face of corporations and imagines them to have a, 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 a monopoly of power they do not have. Very sad. Enough for today. Thank you very much. I, I will, if you'd like, if you have questions, I'd be glad to be here.